بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Respected brothers and also sisters I think listening upstairs السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you in Coventry today. It's actually my first time. Deli I think, no, I have delivered a talk in a masjid in Coventry, but first time at this masjid. May <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the organizers of today's program, the committee, <coughs> the imams, and Brother Yunus who uh, called me. The topic today is a very important topic that I've been told to discuss and uh, talk about which you might have seen on the poster, on the flyer. The title is <coughs> Understanding the Issue of the Tasawwuf and Sufism with Balance. <coughs> the heading itself probably gives us some idea that this issue is sometimes understood without balance. That's the reason the heading is Understanding Tasawwuf with Balance. If we had the title Understanding Tasawwuf, then that's it, Understanding Tasawwuf. But when we say Understanding Tasawwuf <coughs> with Balance, this gives an idea that there is an imbalanced understanding of this topic as well. When something is imbalanced, what does it mean, something imbalanced? When, normally, when something is imbalanced, you have two <coughs> sides to that. Imbalance, it's this way or that way. This is, you know, children go outside when they play on, what, what do they play on? That seesaw. Is it called? Seesaw. Yes. So there's an imbalance. You have an extreme to the right, you have an extreme to the left. And this is generally with many issues of deen. Sometimes within Muslims, we have an imbalanced understanding of a particular issue. And normally the best of ways or the, is the middle way, khayr al aw satuha, to understand something with moderation, with, with, uh, with balance. And this is what our deen itself, Islam as a whole, as a religion, is considered to be a balanced religion between Christianity and Judaism. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, in the Quran, when you, when we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, we make dua daily in our salah. Ihdina salat al-mustaqim. This is the straight path. But straight path as in the balanced path. It's the middle path. The real translation of mustaqim is straight path. But why we say it's straight? Because it's straight. It doesn't turn right or it doesn't turn left. You don't fall right or you don't fall left. It's in between. Ihdina salat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-ladheena an'amta alayhim This is all ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem And then Allah said the two imbalanced ways Or the pa two paths you don't want to go on to غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ alayhim. That's one on the right And وَلَا الضَّالِينَ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ alayhim. And it's وَلَا الضَّالِينَ مِنْ غَيْرِ الضَّالِينَ Not the path of those upon whom Allah's anger wrath descended And neither the path of those people who deviated so Islam as a whole, as a religion, as a, as a deen, as a sharia, is something which is in the middle. As a religion, it's in bet between the two paths. And غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين and والضالين, both of these two, as the commentator of the, of the Quran explained, if you look in the tafsir, etc., these two paths are referring to the paths of the Jews. Earlier, this is not a swear word to the Jews or the Christians. You have to be very careful what we say today. But this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about historically the path of the Jews, the certain people in Baru Israel, they went down the route of maghdub alayhim, ghayr al-maghdub alayhim. So Allah's anger descended on them. 
And then certain Christians in that time, waladhalin, they went onto the path of deviation. And Allah is telling the Muslims that this is not just for the Christians and the Jews, al-Mustaqim, that we should also not, not get those tendencies of those people upon whom the wrath and anger of Allah descended. And neither should we go into those acts that will deviate us. So anyway, Islam as a whole is a balanced religion. So within Islam, within deen, everything, there's, there's a balanced understanding with all issues. And I seriously find this within the Muslim community with lots of issues, not just Tasawwuf and Sufism, but with many issues. Some people are too extreme on this side with a very extreme understanding. Some people are too liberal and relaxed on another side with a different understanding. And the truth is always sometimes in the middle. I can count like numerous examples right now that, that are coming to my mind in terms of how people deal with issues of Islam. Either you go right or either you go left. People don't want to stay in the middle. There's so many examples. Just one example that's come to mind, and I, it's not my topic, but um, it's just come to mind. I normally, ex when, 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 we, when I talk with fellow students in the class and we discuss issues, a lot of times issues come up that today we find that there's an attack on many rules and regulations relating to Islam and Deen. Like, for example, inheritance. Like, for example, the rights of women or the role of women. Or the rights and rule, uh, regulations relating to marriage. The status of a woman. Just so many issues. Hudud punishments in Islam. Qisas and hudud and capital punishment and all these issues we have in Islam. Sometimes we have people on the right in an who we say have gone very extreme to the right, who teach these issues. These are issues that have come down generation from generation from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The understanding of deen, which has come from the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum. Like I give you an example. The Quran says, Allah is talking about men, women, husband, wife relationship if there's difficulty. What are the three stages of Islah and rectification? And he mentions the first and then he mentions the second. And then he says, Now, on one hand, you will get some people who've not, who don't really live in the world. They've just lived in a masjid or a madrasa or somewhere or have a very harsh, classical way of understanding deen. They will say, Beat up your wife, hit them. Allah is saying, Wadribu hunna, hit them. Beat them up. If your wife says anything, smack them. Pitaikaro. You know, beat them up as much as you want. This is one extreme way of dealing with this issue. Like I was in America once in New York, and uh, one student was telling me that I was once eating with uh, a fork or a knife. So he said, one Mawlana Sahib came to me, he said, have you become a kafir? Have you become a, you're a kafir, eating like the kuffar, you become a kafir. So that's one extreme. On the other hand, it's all fine, no problem. Like this, wadribuhunna, there are people who actually translate the word wadribuhunna. They say that wadribuhunna in the Quran also means traveling. Darb fil ard means traveling. So they say that Allah is saying that when you have problems with your wife, go for a honeymoon, go for a nice vacation, sort your things out. Wadribu hunna means travel with them. That's a liberal extreme. There, there is an extreme on the right, there is an extreme on the left. Some people say all these hudud, qisas, they all abolished, these are medieval times, this is, there's no place in Islam for this. Inheritance two for one, brothers receive double than the female, male two times twofold. This is wrong, it doesn't apply in our times, it's completely changed, new ijtihad, a complete liberal understanding of deen. On another hand, there are people who explain this issue, but in a very, very harsh type of way, which doesn't really fit in with people in today's climate. So when I speak to the students, I say to them always that one of the greatest, if not the greatest challenge for a talib ilm for a student today, is to present to the world, to the Muslim ummah, the correct, traditional teachings of Islam with the correct interpretations, the interpretation that's come from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, the Tabi'un, generation after generation, traditional teaching of Islam without changing the rules, 
but learn how to explain them in the modern context. How to explain them to the wider community. Speak in a language, talk in a language, in a way that people are able to digest these rules today. And this is the greatest challenge for students of knowledge and young scholars, that they learn about these issues and then explain them in a very balanced way. So anyway, this is a topic on its own that we have a lot of imbalances. Even with ikhtilaf issues, you know, issues of difference of opinion, there's, there's one community on one hand that they just cannot tolerate difference of opinion. Ikhtilaf ummati rahma, which is a saying of the great scholars of the past. We have ikhtilaf, differences of opinion in many issues. Blood comes out from your body according to Imam Shafi'i salah. Wudu is not broken. You have blood coming out all over your hands and you can pray salah, no problem. According to the Hanafi school, blood comes out, the wudu is broken. Now, there's someone who followed the Shafi'i Madhab all his life, he's offered salah doing, not performing wudu after blood came out. Are you going to say you're going to hellfire because Allah will not accept your salah? Moon sighting issues and many issues. There's one, on one side we have people who just cannot tolerate. There's just, this is the only way. How can, this is our communities, how can you respect another opinion, like haq and truth is only one. It's not possible to say, okay, this is my way, but I respect your way. It's just not possible for some communities. On the other hand, there are people who are enlightened at the universities and secular you know, education they've received, and they're very, very respectful and very critical and very open to dialogue and very open to respecting difference of opinion. So what they say is that, look, Deen, you know, there's difference of opinion, you, you respect difference of opinion. So they are also correct and they are also correct and, you know, difference of opinion. So if everyone's correct, then today you do that, today you do this, today I do this, today you follow this mother, today you take, everything's fine. That's another extreme. On this hand, correct ruling is only one, everyone else is wrong. Here, everyone else is right, therefore you can do everything. Both are extremes. The correct way is... Yes, there's other people we can respect their opinion, but you can only do one. And there's a reason why you can only do one that requires another hour lecture. So this is a topic that we need really balance. And let me get to the topic. Tasawwuf, Sufism, is a word that people hear a lot. What is Tasawwuf? What is Sufism? Again, with relate, in, uh, we find, like I said, extremism on both sides. To understand this topic, we have to first understand this issue that when we look at Islam, when we look at the Quran and Sunnah, and when we look at our deen, the whole deen and sharia, all, all of deen, if you look at the sacred text, the whole of Quran and all the hadith, all the rules and regulations and injunctions and the guidance and the guidelines and the ahkam that have been given to us in the Quran and Sunnah, we can divide them into three categories. The Quran is filled with guidelines. Much of the Quran is actually not to do with do's and don'ts. Much of the Quran is actually to do with just general nasiha. But a lot of the hadith and sunnah is to do with ahkam and laws. But when we look at the whole sacred, the entirety of the sacred text, the Quran and sunnah, we find that the rules and regulations and commands and prohibitions and guidelines and injunctions and you know, guidances <clears throat> can be divided into how many categories? Three categories. Category number one, there are many verses of the Quran and many hadiths that deal with what a person should believe in. That's the first category. Category of guidelines that deal with what a person should believe in. That is the topic of or the category of aqidah. So you have many verses in the Quran talking about tawheed and about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about believing in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about worshipping only one only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, the attributes of Allah he's al khaliq he's al raziq lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad he's own one and only Allah is samad that he is independent everyone is in need of Allah and he is in need of no one etc etc and also laysa kamithlihi shay there's no one like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taqdis of Allah tanzih of Allah uh, all the rules relating to what a Muslim sh man or woman should believe in and also the opposite what a person should avoid in terms of belief so shirk 
associating partners with Allah. In the shirk al adhulmun azim, it's a massive sin. It's haram. It's it's not just haram. It's shirk. Shirk is in Allah in la yaghfir an yushrak bi. La yaghfir ma duna dalik liman yasha. So basically, there are rules to do with the first category, which is what we believe in. This category can be called the category of Tawheed, can be called the category of Aqeedah, the science of Islamic creed, the science of Aqeedah, the science of Usul al-Din. Different names have been given. But then we have a second category. The rules and regulations we, we, that we find in the Quran and Sunnah that deal with the external, the body, the external laws. Like, for example, like what? Again, in this category, you have do's and don'ts, commands and prohibitions. So commands such as offer five time prayers, fast in Ramadan, perform zakat, pay zakat, perform hajj, and all the other external laws, rules and regulations to do with the external body. Just as there are commands relating to the external body, there are prohibitions relating to the external body. Like what? The prohibition of stealing, theft, robbery, fornication, zina, hitting someone, murdering someone, killing someone, disobeying your parents, etc. etc. Riba, usury, interest, deceiving, cheating, fraud in business, harming someone, inconveniencing someone, swearing, slandering. These are all the prohibitions relating to the external. External, whether it's the mouth, whether it's the ear listening to music, haram music, whether it's punching someone with the hand, whether writing something on online and swearing at someone virtually, all of this is to do with the external. This category, the laws relating to the external, whether it's to do with social laws or business laws or ibadat, worshipping Allah, fasting zakat, this category is known as the category of fiqh. Again, various names have been given. The first category was called Aqeedah, the science of Aqeedah, or the category of Aqeedah, or uh, Usul al-Din, or Tawheed, etc. This category is, or Iman, first category. The second category is called Fiqh, or it can be called Islam, or it can be called uh, Al-Fiqh al-Asghar. Different types of names have been given. Then we have the third category. When we look again at the Quran and Sunnah, all the rules and regulations of the Quran and Sunnah, which is like an introduction to what I really want to say. When we look at the laws of the Quran and Sunnah, the guidelines and the prohibitions and the commands, those that deal with the internal, the soul, the heart, internal, just as there are laws relating to the external, there are laws relating to the internal. Just as the, with the second category, there were commands like offer salah and pay zakat and observe fast and prohibitions like zina and stealing and theft and robbery and murder. Internally with the soul there are also commands and prohibitions. Commands such as have sincerity, ikhlas. Be sincere in everything that you do. Do it only for the sake of Allah. This is internal, it's to do with the heart, the soul. Have sincerity, khushu in salah, devotion. Now, salah, there's an external. I lift my hand, raise my hand, this here, I pray here, here, I recite Surah Al Fatiha, this Surah, Sajda Sahu, if I make a mistake, Rukur. This is all to do with the second category. This is the external, the outer shell of the salah. I shouldn't talk in salah, I shouldn't turn right whilst I'm offering salah, I shouldn't eat in salah. It invalidates my salah. This is all to do with the second category. But in salah, in prayer, I should have khushur, I should have khudu, I should have devotion, concentration, I should be thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ta'abud Allah ka'anna worship Allah as though you are seeing Allah. If you can't get to that level, then at least know that Allah is watching over you. And concentration, try to understand the meanings. Why am I standing before Allah? Why am I reading Surah Al-Fatiha? What's the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha? When I go into Ruku, why am I saying Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim? Why Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim in Ruku and why Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la in Sujood? What's the difference between Azim and what's the difference between A'la and why in Ruku, A'la and why uh, uh, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim in, in Ruku and why Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la in Sujood? All the concentration, this is the inner part of the prayer. This is to do with the third category. There are commands like sincerity, like khushu, tawakkul, reliance on Allah, uh, 
after taking the means. Reliance of Allah after taking the means. Very important. Tawakkul doesn't mean you don't take the means. Tawakkul means the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, tie your camel and then rely on Allah. Take medication, then rely on Allah. You know, if there's a virus, take the means to protect yourself, then rely on Allah. So tawakkul, reliance on Allah, love of Allah, love of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sabr, patience, all these uh, giving preference to others, thinking good about other people, uh, tawadu, humility, looking down on yourself, not thinking yourself to be big. These are all the commands to do with the soul. And likewise, there are prohibitions. Just like externally, there are prohibitions like zina and stealing and theft. Prohibitions like pride, arrogance, jealousy, major sins, hatred, thinking big of yourself, being insincere, being ungrateful to Allah, and being materialistic and having love of dunya. This is the third category. Now this third category, look, in the time of the Messenger وسلم, there was no classification like this because there was no need. When the companions would come to the Messenger وسلم, to ask any question, whether it's to do with the first category, second category, third category, they would just come to the Messenger وسلم, and say, Ya Rasulullah, uh, my you know, blood came out, do I have to do wudu? Or I've got something <coughs> relating to, is this pride, arrogance, or, what, or this issue about aqidah? They used to just ask one person and Muslims were less and there was no need to sort of classify these into three different branches. As time passed, because there were new problems and Muslims spread far <coughs> and wide, the great scholars of this ummah, they dedicated their lives to these three branches. So the first category <coughs> became a branch of Islam. Books started being written in that branch. There are ulama and scholars who dedicated their days and nights, mornings and evenings, weekends and weekdays, dedicated to this one branch of aqidah. You can find two, three thousand books on the science of aqidah. There are people who teach aqidah. There are people who teach Islamic creed, aqidah tahawi of Imam al tahawi and books and books and different ways of understanding aqidah. It's a course on its own, a topic on its own. It was called Ilmul Aqidah, Ilmul Kalam, Ilmul Tawheed, Usuluddin, like I said, all the different names. It became a science on its own. Likewise, the, middle, the second category, <coughs> external laws. That's probably the most comprehensive. This became the science of fiqh. Many scholars dedicated their whole lives to this second category. What's the second category? The category of fiqh. This is where we had the Hanafi school and the Shafi'i school and the Maliki school and the Hanbali school and all the different schools. All the rules and you can literally have 60, 70, 80, 100,000, 200,000 books in Arabic or more, more than that. If you gather all the schools of thought, you could have 800,000 books on fiqh. It's a massive subject. And then likewise, the third category of laws also required attention. So there were scholars who dedicated their lives to this third category. This third category, known as tazkiyah, purification of the heart, or in light of the hadith, because you see this, this classification is based on a hadith, the famous hadith of Jibra'il. A lot of people know about this hadith. Once Jibra'il came to the Messenger وسلم, the companions didn't know in the beginning it was him, but he came and asked a few questions, long hadith in Sunan, uh, Sahih Muslim and elsewhere. It's a very famous hadith. But he asked three questions. He said, Mal Iman, what is Iman, O Messenger of Allah? He said, O oh, Muhammad, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Iman. Tell me what is Iman. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, An tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa al-yawm al-akhir wa al-qadri khayrihi wa sharri. Iman is you believe in Allah, you believe in the angels, you believe in the life hereafter, you believe in the books, you believe in fate, good or bad. Then he said, Mal Islam, what is Islam? Islam, he said, Antashhada Allah ilaha illallah. Iman was an tu'mina. You believe in your heart, in your mind, you believe, that's Iman. Islam, he said, you say the shahada externally. Remember, being a Muslim is not saying the shahada externally, that's just the external sign. A lot of people don't know this. You know, a lot of people, I, I've, I've conducted a few people who have become Muslims, you know. I remember once I was in Norway and uh, they brought somebody that uh, they wanted to embrace Islam. So I said, okay, inshallah, before we'll, we'll go ahead with the embracing of Islam. But I said, look, Islam is not when you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Say, just say after me, Ashhadu, Ashhadu. They don't really understand what's going on. That doesn't make you a Muslim. 
That's not what makes you a Muslim. Imagine a Chinese person doesn't know something, he's just reading, he's just reading a book. I shall do, uh, uh, doesn't even really know what it means, he never heard of Islam. Does that person become a Muslim? No. Saying that doesn't make you a Muslim. You become a Muslim by what's inside. Then, of course, we need a sign externally. How will you know someone's a Muslim? Should we bury him in a, or her in a Muslim burial place, cemetery or not? So shahada is an external sign of what's inside, which also means which we have to be very careful that if we have the external sign but not inside, then we're not really Muslims. That's the dangerous part. If we say shahada all the time externally, we've said it, but internally the iman's not there, we're not really Muslims. Yet yeah, we'll be treated as Muslims by people in the community, but Allah will not treat us as Muslims. May Allah protect us. And the opposite is true. Someone has iman in the heart but never said shahada in the world. Nobody will treat them as a Muslim. They will not bury. He can be buried in a non-Muslim cemetery, but on Yom Al-Qiyamah he will be resurrected as a Muslim. Because iman is iman bil qalb. It's in the heart. The iqrar bil lisan is actually a sign. So, therefore, we are having this uh, ceremony where, so the person came and I explained. I said, look. For you to become a Muslim, you need to know these things. That's why when someone becomes a Muslim, explain the basic aqaid to them first, there and then. If they haven't already been explained. <coughs> I said, look, first thing is you need to renounce. Were you a Christian before, Jew, whatever you are? Say, I completely renounce all the things that I believed in. Completely. Clean slate. Now, you need to know there's only one Allah you believe in. Who is this Allah? This is your God, your creator. You have to believe one and only, absolute monotheism, absolute um, tawheed and oneness of Allah. You have to believe completely in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only creator, he's the only khaliq. And you only worship one and only Allah. There is no one like Allah, Allah Samad. I explained all of that in that gathering. And then I said, after that, you believe in the messenger. All the prophets and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he is the last prophet. You have to believe he is the final prophet. There's no other prophet after him. Anywhere you think there's another prophet, then this, this is not Islam. What are the attributes of a prophet? A prophet is somebody who's ma'asum, he's infallible. A, a prophet is somebody who is sharp and has intelligence given by Allah. And the person, a prophet is someone who has done tabligh. Allah has given him uh, a um, responsibility of conveying. There are attributes of the prophet. This is what you study in Aqidah. And then you need to believe in the life hereafter. You have to believe. Resurrection. Ba'ath ba'd al mawt and all the angels. Don't think angels are just supernatural spirits. No, you believe, you have to believe in physical angels. That's another extreme. Some people think angels don't really exist. There's no such a thing as shaitan and no such a thing as angels. They're just positive and negative vibes. Somebody said coronavirus is shaitan. <laughs> and uh, some positive vibes, that's angels. Some people don't, no, you have to believe that there are angels and the hereafter and Quran, every word of the Quran. Explain all of this. So I listed all of these things, and the persons, I said, explain back to me all of them in English. So they explained them back to me. I said, give me the summary of what I've just explained to you, that I believe in this, this, this. I made them repeat all of that, and then I said to the audience, takbir, now say takbir, don't wait for the shahada. Like you can say it then as well, but now they've become a Muslim. I said, now you're a Muslim, alhamdulillah, you're a Muslim. Now let's for everyone, you know, to everyone to know and for barakah purposes and for everyone as a sign. Now repeat, it's good to repeat. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. But I said to them, she became or he became a Muslim before we said the shahada. This is something that a lot of people don't know, but anyway, this is a side topic. So I was saying that in the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would ask questions relating to all three topics. But later on, these three became, uh, yeah, so the hadith that was mentioned, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was asked, Mal Iman, he said, what's Iman? He said, Iman is, you believe in the heart, in the mind. Then Jibreel, peace be upon him, asked him, Mal Islam, what is Islam? So he said, you say the Shahada, wa tuqeem as-salah, wa tu'ti al-zakat, wa tasuma Ramadan, wa tahujj al-bayt in istata'ta ilayhi sabila. Offering salah, fasting in Ramadan, paying zakat, and performing hajj if you have the means to do so. These are all external laws. Then he said, Mal Ihsan. O oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me what is Ihsan? That's the word, Ihsan. 
So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ihsan is an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. You worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. Basically talking about the sincerity, ikhlas of the heart, khushu of the heart. That you need to get to a level that when you offer salah, you are seeing Allah. Seeing Allah with what? With your heart. You can't see Allah in this world with these eyes. You can see Allah with the heart. And seeing Allah with the heart daily in our life is more important than seeing Allah in a dream. Seeing Allah with the heart 24 hours every day right now, meaning we envisage Allah. We, this is muraqabah, thinking of Allah, knowing that Allah is listening to, watching over everything that I say, do, or think about. Seeing Allah with the heart, especially when we offer salah. This is called Ihsan. أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ Worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ And if you can't get to that level that you are observing and watching and seeing Allah, then at least know that Allah is watching over you. This is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. This is called Ihsan. You know, there's this Imam, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, rahimahullah, he mentions in, in his commentary of this uh, hadith, he said that, Allah says in the Quran, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةِ Those people who have the quality of Ihsan, أَحْسَنُوا They have the quality of Ihsan, their reward in the Akhirah will be Al-Husna, this is the ayah of the Quran, Al-Husna, which means reward from Allah, Jannah, Paradise, وَزِيَادَةٌ And you will get extra. The people of Ihsan will get extra. Most of the commentators and mufassirun of the Quran say this extra is to see Allah with your eyes. So he says that the reason why this is a special, special, um, like a reward for the people of Ihsan, because the people of Ihsan spent all their life seeing Allah with their heart, so in Akhirah they'll get to see Allah with their eyes. Illadina Ahsanu, the people of Ihsan, who see Allah with their heart in their, this life, will see Allah with the eyes in the next life. May Allah grant us. Ameen. So this is a reward in Jannah. So anyway, this third category, Ihsan. This the third category has been given many names. Now the issue is that names and terms are not important. We get obsessed with titles. La mushahata fil istilah. They say there's no terminologies and words are not really important. You, someone can do zina and call it nikah. Will it become nikah? No. It will still be zina. Somebody can give interest and you know, engage in an interest-based transaction and call it sale. It won't be sale. It will be interest. And you could call it interest, but it may be sale. Anyway, so this, this third category we can say Ihsan, which is in that hadith. We can say Tazkiyah, which is in the Quran. Tazkiyah means purification of the heart, purification of the soul. Some people like to call it Tasawwuf or Sufism. It's just a title that was a term that started becoming used later on. But what is this third category? This third category basically is, like I said, ex internal laws. This third category relates to the obligation. Remember the word obligation. Obligation means what? Fard. This is not sunnah or mustahab or, or like an act of fadila or virtue. This is fard and not even fard kifaya, like janazah prayer. This is fard ayn. Personally obligatory on every man, woman. Fard ayn. Just like salah, five time prayers is fard. And Ramadan fasting is further than everyone, unless you're ill or sick or something. It is a personal obligation. It is a fard on every Muslim man, woman, to make sure that they work on their heart, on their souls, and implement all the commands, the faraid. Like externally, we, we implement salah, fasting, zakat, hajj. It is an obligation. These people take, don't take this seriously. It's an absolute obligation upon every man, woman to make sure 
that they learn about and then act upon and work all their lives on their souls to implement the commands of Allah in relation to the heart. So Allah said pride is haram, arrogance is haram, uh, uh, pride and arrogance, kibr is haram. So we know this is a major haram. This is haram like committing zina, like eating pork. You're eating a pork, meat, hamburger, it's equally haram as having pride. There's no difference. This is haram, this is haram. Zina is haram, pride is haram. لَا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ مَنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالُ حَبَّةً مِنْ كِبْرٍ The hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone has a small atoms worth of pride shall not enter paradise. Numerous hadiths of the Quran, uh, verses of the Quran and, and hadiths from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is an obligation. We know zina is haram. We try to stay away from it, inshallah ta'ala. We know stealing is haram. We stay away from it. But do we know that pride is a massive sin? This is relating to the third category. It's an obligation to avoid all the things Allah prohibited. Arrogance, pride, I mentioned. Ostentation, riya. Yura'oon al-nas. Wa la yathkuroon Allah illa qalila. Showing off. Man salla yura'i faqad ashraka billah. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever offers salah to show off, he's committed shirk with Allah. Imagine, showing off, doing anything for makhluq, for the creation of Allah, it's a massive haram. If I'm praying salah right now and people are coming, someone watching me, Allahu Akbar, as soon as someone enters the door, Allah, I'm trying to act a bit more pious, major haram. Any act, good act, of deen or servicing the community, donating, giving in charity, oh people think I'm rich, let me give 20,000 pounds, write my name down, yes, alhamdulillah, everyone's gonna say that I'm very, very charitable. Major haram, forget the reward, it's, you've committed a sin for giving that money. The hadith says, give with your right hand, your left hand doesn't even know. I'm not saying it's not permissible publicly, sometimes it's permissible, <coughs> maybe you want to uh, uh, encourage other people, fine. But in the, we can't judge anyone as well, remember. This is what we need to judge our own selves. Which, what intention do I have? So showing off, if I'm giving a lecture here to show off, forget the reward, I go back with sins. May Allah protect us, I mean. All of this is a major haram, showing off. And then jealousy, hasad. The first person to commit the sin of jealousy was who? Iblis. With Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. He telling me to make sajda to Adam. Khalaqtahu min narim wa khalaqtahu min teen. Yeah. So this is a massive, now jealousy, imagine, do we take jealousy as seriously as we take zina or eating a hamburger? It's a massive sin. Iyakum wal hasad. Fa inna al hasad yaakulu al hasanat kama ta'akulu al nar al hatab. Sunana fabi Dawood. Beware of jealousy because jealousy eats away all your good deeds, all your salah and everything. Like fire eats away wood. One daughter-in-law jealous with another daughter-in-law. One mother-in-law jealous with this one. Someone's jealous with their promotion. One co-worker jealous with another. One student because he's got more marks. I'm jealous with him. All haram. So we are daily living with committing things as great as zina and eating pork and drinking alcohol. Imagine. This is why this is an obligation that all these haram things, pride, arrogance, showing off, jealousy, hatred, all these are spiritual diseases. These are known as radha'il, blameworthy character traits. We translate them as in English, blameworthy character traits. All of these need to be replaced. So pride needs to be replaced with humility and tawadu. من طوادع لله رفعه الله. We need to be humble. It's an obligation, just like fasting in Ramadan is fard. Having humility is also fard. Likewise, ikhlas, which is the opposite of showing off. So just like giving zakat is a fard, having ikhlas for the sake of Allah is also a fard. Not being jealous, giving preference to others. All of this, tawakkul and reliance on Allah, sabr, patience, all these are commands from Allah. So this is what this third category relates to. So basically, the objective 
of this third category, whether someone wants to call it Ihsan, somebody wants to call it Tazkiyah, somebody wants to call it Tasawwuf, somebody wants to call it Sufism, or somebody wants to give you another name and call it Green. It doesn't really matter. It's what's, what are you really doing? You can give it any name. You know this, what people sometimes, you see, another, one, the two extremes we find with Tasawwuf, which I didn't mention, I, was, I just went on to that there are imbalances. On one side of the Muslim world, people have this kind of a complete hate to just the term Tasawwuf. It's like you hear the word Sufi, it's like you think, you know, someone's going wrong, and there's like some shit's happening. Like suddenly, like some wording dervish is like jumping up and down, and someone took a sword and put it through the, you know, in the fire and eating fire and you know, some people do that in the name of the soul, which is of course got nothing to do with the soul. But some people just outrightly completely reject the soul and Sufism. And the reason, there are two reasons. One reason is because they don't know the reality. They haven't understood what really it is. And number two, the reason is they see the people who are doing things which have nothing to do with Islam and the soul. So, those people gave them the excuse to just completely out and reject. And then on the other hand, we have people in the name of the soul do things which, which have got nothing to do with, forget the soul, even Islam. And those extremes are of different levels. So like some things are people are taking swords and putting them through their bodies. Some people are you know, going around fire and some people are doing this. But then there are other levels of extremes as well, which are found in our communities as well, which I'm just going to mention as well. But this... These are the two balance, uh, imbalances, two extremes. So if somebody wants to use tasawwuf, they can use it. There's nothing wrong. Like you use the word grammar, nahu. There's nothing wrong. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi didn't use the word sarf and nahu and things like that. It's just a term. But if somebody doesn't want to use it, no problem. It's not necessary as well. I personally, I prefer the term tazkiyah for this third category because it's in the Quran. The one who purified the soul has reached success. One of the objectives of the Messenger وسلم, was to purify the souls. He spiritually purified the companions, the Sahaba, removed all these uh, diseases and illnesses and sicknesses, spiritual ones. The blameworthy character traits like competition and jealousy. That's how they were, the Arabs. One tribe was jealous and fighting and having enmity for 40 years. The Messenger وسلم, came and cleaned their hearts, cleaned them. Then they became such that they were dying and they wanted water and they saw their brother dying out of water and said, no, go and give the water to him. And the person went to him and said, no, I'm hearing my brother also gasping for water. Go and give it to him. He went to him, he passed away. He came to the second, passed away. He came to the first, passed away. The same people, imagine, the same people who would fight for 40 years for a chicken. That's how they were before in the days of Jahiliyyah. The same people who would kill one another for a, for a child that came and trespassed their area. They would fight for 40 years, generation after generation. These people, they changed in such a way with the tarbiyah of the Messenger sallallahu him. This is what he done to them. He cleansed their hearts to the point that they are now giving their lives away so that someone else can drink water. They have guests at their house and what do they do? They give preference to others and they stay hungry. They pretend they're eating. You know the famous story. The guest came and put the children to sleep and then the lamp was on and just pretended put the lamp on the Sahabi. The Messenger وسلم, said, who can take this guest? He went home. He didn't ask the the wife, he had no mobile phone. I'm bringing some, someone guest. You never do that, you have to ask your wife first. <laughs> Just don't go with like 10 people, yeah, go and cook now. You don't do things like that. These are also the etiquettes and the rules of Islam. But anyway, he went and he, he put the lamp off and the guest was eating and he was just pretending. Eating, pretending. Had only one person's food and he gave it to the guest. This is called Dazkia. So, this tazkiyah, like I said, I prefer this term better. Tazkiyah, but you can call it ihsan, you can call it ilmul qalb, the science of the heart. But it's a science, it's a topic, and it's a very, very important um, uh, branch of Islam. And everyone has to learn about this. 
And the word tasawwuf was made up later on. Some people said, where did this term come from? This term, <coughs> numerous theories have been given. Some said it's from the word sifah, because sifah means a quality. So this third category is about what? Adorning yourself with all these sifat, <coughs> character traits. Removing all the blameworthy character traits and adorning yourself with the praiseworthy character traits. So many ulama said that because it's from sifa, so the person with this quality sifa attribute, Sufi tasawwuf. Some said it's from the saf, the first saf. So all the pious people used to offer salah in the first saf, so it became tasawwuf and Sufi. Some said it came from the term suf, which means wool, because they used to just go and wear a lot of wool because they never used to be materialistic. So they started wearing the wool, so they became known as Sufis and it became known as Tasawwuf. The fish has done, right? I suddenly thought that it was we prayed Maghrib and it was Isha. That's fine, no problem. Anyway, I'm concluding, but I really want to talk about some of the issues that are really important. So this is the importance of this branch. This is a branch. They actually give a definition to this branch, and they, you know, the ulama have said that it's ilmun yu'rafu bihi anwa'u al-fadail wa kayfiyyatu iktisabiha wa anwa'u al-radha'il wa kayfiyyatu ijtinabiha. You learn about the praiseworthy qualities and character traits and how to acquire them and you learn about the negative and the blameworthy and the sinful character traits and how to avoid them. This is what this whole branch is about. Now, the issue is that with all three branches, can you learn them on your own or do you need someone to teach you? Any branch of Islam, let alone Islam, any branch of the world to be a cook, you need a teacher, a good cook, is someone who learned by another good cook. A good chef is someone who learns by another good chef. If you take a book in Indian Delights and start cooking like some man, if you're a man and you've never cooked like me in your life, start cooking, you'll see, I don't know what you'd have, what you'd make. Every issue in life, any expertise, we need a teacher. In Islam, likewise, the first category was which category? Aqeedah. You can't learn Aqeedah on your own. You have to have a teacher to teach you the science of Aqeedah. The more in-depth study you want, the more in-depth teacher you will require. Likewise, Fiqh, you have to study the Hanafi or the Shafi'i or the Maliki or the Hanbali Madhab. You have to have a teacher. You study Nurul Ida and your Quduri, Mukhtasar al-Quduri and your Hidayah. And in the Shafi'i Madhab, different books that you can study. And in the Maliki Madhab and in the Hanbali Madhab and the Fiqh books and you study, which are based on the Quran and Sunnah, of course. So you need a teacher to teach you. Likewise, this third category, this third category is a branch because there are rules and regulations and you require a teacher to teach you, guide you, give you guidelines, give you teachings in terms of how to acquire these character traits, the rules and regulations. If you just take one issue like pride, pride is an issue you need to learn about. It's not just like pride is haram. Some people will say, okay, we understand in the first category you need a teacher to teach you. And we understand in the second category you need someone to teach you all how to pray salah, etc. Do I need a teacher in the third category to tell me pride is haram? No, no, no. It's not going to just tell you pride is haram. He's going to tell you, give you a one-week course on the rules and regulations, the fiqh of pride. Every Muslim should go through a course. Sometimes, like I'll give you just an example. Pride is haram, sinful. But you have something else called Izzatun Nafs. Izzatun Nafs is self-respect. We have a duty as Muslims to show respect to our own selves. Inferiority complex is not part of, part of the teachings of Islam. Inferiority complex, you should have confidence. You should have self-respect. To degrade yourself, like, and you know, sometimes, this is why you know, sometimes people joke in such a way that they lose their own respect in the community, that's sinful. You should be jovial, kind, considerate, nice to everyone, but you should have your self-respect. So self-respect is one thing, pride is something else. So how do you know? We need to learn about this. The, 
The issue is we need someone else. Normally, we these especially in this category is very difficult to detect your own self. A proud person will never say, I'm proud. It's impossible. You need someone to tell you. We need someone else. We need someone else. That's for sure. We need someone. That someone could be anyone. In the beginning, you might say, okay, I'll just tell someone else. I'll just make my wife as my, as my sheikha guide. No problem. Best islah, tazkiyah, your wife will do. Or I'll make my husband. Technically, that's possible. No problem. You see, it's not, it's not necessary, like I will mention, because some of the things we've hyped them. Basically, tasawwuf was just islah of the qalb, tazkiyah. That's it. That's 90% of tasawwuf. 80%, let's say 80%. Of the sawuf is working constantly all our lives on our hearts to acquire these praiseworthy character traits and remove the haram, <coughs> blameworthy character traits. But we need someone, first of all, we need someone to tell us. Because am I showing off or not? I can't tell myself. Have I got pride or is it izzatun nafs? Is it pride or is it self respect? Humility is required, tawadu is required. But degrading yourself, that's haram. Humility doesn't mean, oh, I'm nothing, and you know, just fall down, and I'm, I'm just nothing, and I'm nothing, and like, I don't, I'm not even worth anything, and just beat me up, and just, you know, throw dirt on me, and that's how I'm humble. That's actually haram. Talking about a ni'mah that Allah has given you, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ is good. تَحْدِيدْ بِالنِعْمَةِ But trying to show off with it, that's haram. So when is it showing off? When is it giving, talking about the ni'mah that Allah has given you? When is it pride and when is it izzatun nafs? When is it arrogance and when is it self-respect? When is it humility and when is it degrading yourself? All of these things, there's rules and regulations. You can't just learn yourself. You need someone else, number one. That no one else, that someone else, you want it to be a human, right? You want a lion to tell you or a snake? No, you want a human being. So we have decided we need someone else. Then we've decided we want that person to be a human. Then you want that human to be a Muslim or a non-Muslim? You want that person to be a Muslim. So then that we've decided that that person is a Muslim. Then after that, do you, do you want any fasiq, someone who's clubbing and pubbing and drinking alcohol, or do you want someone who's practicing? Someone who's practicing. So we've decided that person has to be practicing. Then we think that that person who's practicing, is he practicing with this third category? Has he gone through the process himself with this third category? Is he someone who's worked for 30, 40 years on his heart? Do we want that person or somebody who's got no knowledge of this science? Someone with knowledge. So you need a human being, you need a Muslim, a practicing one, and a knowledgeable Muslim, and somebody who knows about these issues, that's the person you will turn to and say, look, I will ask you for advice about these issues, and you guide me. This person is called a sheikh in tasawwuf, or whatever you want to call it. Some people say, like, what's the sheikh? Why do you have to have a sheikh? You have to have a teacher in aqidah, you have to have a sheikh in fiqh, you, you have to have a sheikh in nahwa, a sheikh in sarf, in qira'ah, in hifz, in tajweed, in qira'ah. So this is a sheikh teaching me this branch of Islam. That's it, there's nothing more. Whether you want to call that person sheikh, or whether you want to call that person whatever you want to call. <coughs> Names and terms don't matter. Some people say peel. Don't call him peel, call him beer if you want to. Because na names don't really matter. Call him Ustad, call him you know, teacher, call him whatever you want to call that person. It's not necessary to call him a Shaykh. <coughs> Some people call Murshid. They say Murshid. I asked once, there was a friend I met once, an Arab brother. I think it was from Morocco or something, a long time ago when I was studying. We were talking about these navigations, you know these navigations. Now we have on you know, Google Maps, but when this was when the first navigations had come out. People don't even use navigations now, it's on the phone. So I said, what do you call this in Arabic? We were talking in Arabic and I said to him, Tom Tom used, that was navigation. I said, what do you call this in Arabic? He said, well, it depends. In kunta salafiyan fa dalil wa in kunta sufiyan fa murshik. If you're a Salafi, it's called what? Dalil. Dalil means indicator. It's indicating you to something. And if you're a Sufi, it's called a Murshid, a guide. So anyway, Murshid just means a guide. So, we need someone who's an expert. Now, I will just mention two, three more points relating to this, which are very important. You have, after that, people ask that, okay, I'll have a guide, but what's this 
pledge bay'ah that takes place. Have you heard of this bay'ah? Now the issue is bay'ah is 2% of the 100% of the zakiyah. Or maybe 1%. Or not even a percent really. Maybe like 0.1%. This is from the teachings of Hakim al Maulana Shaitani Rahimullah and one of my teachers, Shaykh al-Islam of Sitaqul Uthmani Hafizahullah. Bay'ah is absolutely not the obligation or the objective. It's not far, it's not waji, maybe more sunnah, but it's not the objective. Somebody can be on the path of tasawwuf and tazki and ihsan, but never ever do bay'ah in his life. And somebody can do bay'ah to 250,000 million shuyukh, but have nothing to do with tasawwuf. Nowadays, the problem is that the sawf has become very symbolic. And this is the problem. This is the other extreme. People identify themselves as part of being a group. Oh, mashallah, this is brother such and such. Uh, he's connected with this. What do you mean he's connected? He's connected to his wife. He's connected to her. She's connected to her husband. This person is such and such. He's connected to this. Nobody should even know. You know, people sometimes ask me, who's your sheikh? I said, it's like you're asking me, who's your wife? <laughs> neither am I going to tell you who's my wife and neither am I going to tell you who's my sheikh. Why do you need to know? Yes, if you come to study, if you're saying I want to study by you this particular subject on science, so now I need to know who you learned by. Yeah, that's I want to study Tajweed by you, so who did you study Tajweed by? Then, then you question. So I say to the person, I'm not going to teach you this subject anyway, so you don't need to know who my teacher is. Because I'm not going to teach you this. So. Nobody needs to know who, this is a private matter. The Shaykh is not some prophet of Allah, he's not a God. He's a pious person, a righteous person, a knowledgeable person, and someone that you turn to for guidance in this particular branch. And he's not the only teacher you have, you can have another teacher in fiqh, you can have another teacher in aqidah, you can have another teacher in another branch of Islam. This is not one, what is it, fits all sizes. It's not like you have one sheikh who controls your life. This is wrong. And this is a sheikh that is only, or a teacher, or a guide, or a murshid, or whatever you want to call him. He is supposed to just guide you in this particular branch. To do with this branch. He is not supposed to tell you whether you should divorce your wife or not. That's not his role. Neither should you need to ask him that question. I've seen many tasawwuf cults where the shaykhs control the mind and the life whether you're eating biryani today or you're eating a kebab today he will tell you what you have to do and charge you for that as well <laughs> and tell you to bring some for him as well <laughs> this is this has got nothing to do with tasawwuf you don't need to know he doesn't need to know what you're doing you need to ask him about this branch this branch only he's just a teacher a very respectful teacher. We should be respecting all Muslims anyway. Anyone who teaches us, we should, we should show respect to them. We should respect. We don't get anything without respect. So, so the people ask this about bay'ah. What is this bay'ah? Bay'ah is basically a pledge. And you know what this is? This is a mutual pledge. <coughs> mutual pledge. What does mutual pledge mean? The guide, the teacher, he is also making a promise, and you are making a promise. This is a mutual promise. What's his promise? His promise is that, you know what, I'm very busy. I've got a very busy life. I've got a family. I've got teaching. I might be an imam in a masjid. I might have teaching, writing. I've got lots of activities. But from my busy time, I promise you, inshallah, that I will give you some time, and if you need some help and advice and guidance in relation to just this topic, don't come to ask me. They might even say, don't come to ask me about a salah, ruling whether this breaks your wudu or not, because I don't have time for that. Go to a faqih or a mufti for that. This is not my area. Some say that. Only with this branch, I will give you time. That's his promise. If he makes that promise and doesn't give you time, then he's sinful for making that promise. And the person, seeker, who's going to the shaykh, is saying that, okay, I will not waste your time. I will always ask you, and I will keep on taking guidelines from you. I will implement them. I will act upon them. It's like, you know, when you enter a madrasa, I will not skive. I will abide by the rules and regulations of this school or this institution. I will come every day. So this is the pledge. This is a mutual pledge. It just makes it more organized and more confirmed. That's the only issue. 
Other than that, there's no, nothing more to this than that. And this is why I know some... You see, it's become very symbolic. So sometimes there'll be one sheikh who will have 400,000 murids, as I like to call them, students. 400,000 or 40,000. How are you going to find time for 40,000 people in your life? Because this is a job. This is not symbolic or just, you know, just for baraka purposes. This is, this is a job. You know how a sheikh should be like a doctor, surgery, or a dentist? How many times do you go to dentist and say, sorry, no more spaces for you? I know a great sheikh, still alive, Hafizahullah ta'ala. The people ask him for bay'ah and his secretary looks that, look, we've got, he takes maximum 40. There's 40 people who I'm helping and as my students, there's no more space, more than 40 or 35. Or, I don't have time, I don't have space for that. Because they've taken it as a job, as a proper responsibility. It's not like, okay, everybody give bay'ah to me and I'm just going to blow on you and everyone's, you know, you give me bay'ah and you're going straight to Jannah. It doesn't work like that. That's not the sawuf. The objective of the sawuf is not that. That just helps. Bayar helps, but it's not the objective. The objective is tazkiyah, which is working on the heart. It's not that the shaykh just looks at you and you become pious overnight. Shaykh al-Islam of Taqi Uthmani Allah explains this in many places. He says people talk about the tawajjuh, you know, the spiritual, spiritual what? Attention. Attention of the guide. He said if that was the case, Abu Jahl would have been a Muslim, Abu Lahab would have, would, would have been a Muslim. The Messenger وسلم, wanted these people to be Muslim. He could have just looked at Abu Jahl one sight and he could have changed overnight. This dunya is dunya is darul asbab. It doesn't work like that. There's no, it's not, there's no thing like the chef just looks at you, otherwise the chef will come and touch your forehead. And that's it. You straight, give you a magic potion and straight, you become a very pious person. It doesn't work like that. But he also says that it doesn't mean there's no basis at all as well. See the balance. There is some, of course, barakah blessings in this. And the example he gave is like if you are on a journey and your car gets stuck. Yes, the battery died. You need someone to bring jumplets, bring their car and start your engine. So the sheikh is like the other car with the jump plates or oh, someone to push your car. Okay, once your car started, you took the jump plates off, that person's gone, you just sit there, okay, that means I'm going, I'm in London now already. You now have to actually travel two hours to go to London. So the traveling you have to do yourself. He just gives you a small push, just starts you off through his guidance, and through, through his good company, through his teachings. That's the meaning of the sight of the sheikh. Nothing more than that. It doesn't mean it has no basis. It has basis, but the rest of the work and the job we have to do. So, this is the basic meaning of giving bay'ah. The real objective is islah, tazkiyah, rectification of the soul, purification of the soul. Then people say this dhikr and you know things... All of this is not objective. The main objective of tasawwuf, Sufism, is purification of the heart and the soul. Bay'ah could be a means. Staying in the company of pious people generally, is a great means. You stay with bad people, you become bad. You stay with good people, you become good. That's the normal principle of life. Everyone knows this. We are human beings, we get affected. So staying in the company of a pious sheikh, you see how he is, you see him, someone comes to talk to him, you see him, you see him how he's walking, you know, somebody uh, uh, opened the door, and he's, the way he's so humble, he's eating, the, look the way he eats. You see some great people. Someone, one of my sheikhs I know, someone comes to meet him, any random person, he'll stand up for him. Regardless, you're not going to just sit there, Salaamu Alaikum, yeah, press my feet. You see the humility and humbleness, the way he reacts and he deals with people. You stay with someone, you see this every day in your life, automatically these things start coming in you. You stay with humble people, you become humble. You stay with pious people, you become pious. So this is a great reason to stay in their company. But you have to find the right person to, find, to stay in their company. So uh, the objective is 
this tazkiyah, like I said, it's not, bay'ah is not the objective, it's a means to it. And even the specific methods of dhikr, that just helps. Allah says in the Quran, udhkurullah, make dhikr. You can do dhikr however you want. At home, upstairs, downstairs, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, like all the time. Yadhkurullah ala kulli yahyani. Quran is actually dhikr, recitation of the Quran. This is what we're doing right now is dhikr as well. Actually, what is dhikr? I did a once lecture, two hours, just on what is the meaning of dhikr. The dhikr of the mind and the heart and dhikr of the tongue. When you say, udhkur, udhkur akhaka, there's two translations. Remember your brother or mention your brother. <coughs> if I say to you, udhkur akhaka, if you say remember, you say, okay, I remembered you in my mind. That's dhikr. Remembering Allah. So before I'm eating, I'm remembering Allah. This food, Allah has given me a great ni'mah. How did this food come to me? Thinking, this is dhikr of the heart. When you're driving a car, you're thinking about Allah, thinking about akhirah, walking, thinking about Allah. All of this is dhikr. The whole life is dhikr. Before sleeping, you're doing dhikr. You're thinking of Allah. The dua, supplications, recitation of the Quran is dhikr. Reading a book about Islam, reading hadith is dhikr because you're remembering Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What we're doing right now is dhikr. All of this is dhikr. And then there's dhikr of the tongue. When you say Subhanallah, you say Allahu Akbar, you say. La ilaha illallah, you say the shahada, you make the dua after salah, Allahumma anta salam, minka salam. All of this is dhikr. But then sometimes they give certain methods of doing dhikr. Again, that's not the objective. The method is just to give you more concentration. You know, sometimes somebody wants to do hits because people ask that this in tasawwuf, they do some group dhikr. Yeah? They say, do la la illallah, this is bid'ah. Or stand, like when I was sitting in Syria, there used to be the shadri dhikr. I attended all of them. You know, the brother was saying, I studied different places, and one of the things that helped me was that I saw everything and anything. So when I was studying in Pakistan, I used to go to all the different shiyukh. So I used to study in Dharan Karachi, where Shaykh al-Islam, Uthmani, Hafidahullah was, but I saw his way, and I saw his way the most, which appealed to me the most. But then I used to go, there was a Shaykh called Hakim Akhtar, Sabrahimahullah. Every Friday, he actually told me, you have to come without fame, Thursday night. So I saw his gathering, I saw his teaching, I saw the people attending, I used to recite Nasheed there. He used to make sure I eat with him after Jumu'ah, so I used to stay with him. Then there was somebody called Mufti Rashid Ahmed Mudiyani, Rahimahullah, Ahsan al Fatawa. So I used to go, after that, he, Hakim Muhtasab, Rahimahullah, used to think that I am going back to Dharam Karachi. So he used to say, okay, take some fruit with you in your pocket and eat it on the bus. But I don't tell him that now I'm going somewhere else. After Maghrib, there's a majlis of Mufti Rashid Ahmed Mudiyani, Rahimahullah. That's like all the people, like with, you know, machine guns and people checking and you know it's a it's a whole complete way of understanding the, these issues and then on thursday nights there used to be when i used to be used to go there sometimes on the, the thursday night the jama'at the bleak uh, gathering they used to have sometimes i used to go there um it's a lot of different places when i was in syria i went to this sheikh i went to that sheikh there was there used to be a shadri gathering there was somebody called Sheikh Sari al Hamawi, rahimahullah. And, and he used to make sure that I come and everyone, Allah, Allah, have you, have you seen that? Like, all over YouTube. I used to attend these gatherings. They were very entertaining anyway. They used to, they used to be nice. But I just wanted to see everything. Though Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Shahuri, rahimahullah, has passed away. His gathering used to be after Jumu'ah Salah. I used to go there as well. Uh, in Halab, there used to be some Sufi shiukh. I used to go there. And then we used to go to Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Naut, rahimahullah. Most of them have passed away now. He used to be like quite strict about these issues and, and about this bid'at in tasawwuf. And then we used to have Shaykh uh, Sa'id Ramadan al Buti, rahimahullah, Shaheed Mountain. He's passed away. I used to attend his gathering once a week. And, and Jumu'ah used to offer there. So when you see all of this, the different flavors, you kind of try to understand. You get to understand a lot of different things. So people ask about this dhikr, this group dhikr. What is it? These are just, these are just methods of concentration. Like someone wants to do hifz of the Qur'an. Yes, you want to memorize the Qur'an. Now somebody will say, if you memorize the Qur'an, memorize it in your bedroom. Just lock the door because there's no uh, obstruction, distraction. distraction. There's no, no one distracting you or uh, <coughs> nobody is inconveniencing you or nobody is basically distracting you. Someone says, stand up and read because if you're sitting down... <coughs> So someone says, stand up. So okay, I'm going to stand up. Someone's driving a car and they're falling asleep, so they just keep on doing this. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> you know, you keep moving your head. You don't want to fall asleep on the motorway. Don't just take, you know, stop over and go to Coventry. Inshallah, you'll have a nice host here in Coventry and sleep at the house. If you're on the M6, 
Oh, I don't know. Whatever it is. But it's just for concentration. You know these methods of dhikr that everyone do it loudly? It's basically that. You know, there's la ilaha illallah. It's just for concentration. For bit of mind, for concentration. If someone said, my concentration is like this, la ilaha illallah, illallah, then that's part of dhikr as well. Just like la ilaha illallah, this is not part of deen as an objective. La ilaha illallah is not part of deen as an objective. Just like I'm just using one method just, just to give me concentration, or someone doing hifz, ya ayyuhaladina, ya ayyuhaladina, moving, just giving me concentration. The one doing dhikr, that's just giving him concentration. It's not the objective. The problem is that people have misunderstood this and they've made all of this as the objective. These are all just methods to give you concentration. If someone thinks it's part of deen, sunnah, farad, mustahab, then it becomes bid'ah. If someone thinks it's got nothing to do with deen, but it's just an external thing just to give me concentration. Dhikr is what Allah has told me to do, but like I'm falling asleep. Or, you know, if I do it by myself, I get lazy. You know, get your son to do hifz at home by himself. Very lazy. Put him in a class where all students are memorizing the Quran together. It's easier. So if I do dhikr at home by myself, one day I'll do it or not, and I'll just get a bit lazy. So let me just go to a place where everyone comes, so then, you know, I'm encouraged by other people. That's what you call group dhikr. Neither the group is an objective, and neither is doing it loudly objective. Rather, it's more recommended to do it silently. And there's some other ayat that is more... Afdal is silent dhikr. But if you need... Like, you know, in salah, it's better to keep your eyes open and pray salah. But if you need concentration, as a remedy, you can close your eyes for a while until you start getting concentration. So likewise, dhikr is better to do it silently. But if you need for concentration, loudly for a while to get that concentration. Once you get that concentration, you get back to the side, which is better. But you can still carry on doing loudly if you want as well. So all of this, to finish off this topic, Tasawwuf, Sufism, Ihsan, Tazkiyah, all of this has everything to do with rectifying the heart, purification of the soul, removing spiritual blameworthy character diseases and traits, replacing them with praiseworthy character traits traits that is the objective there is no difference of opinion within the muslims on this that this is an obligation as for the pledge you do it you don't do it no problem you know sometimes people they give a bay'ah to a sheikh and then they never work on these they just think that's it 99 percent job done no when you give a bay'ah 0.1 percent job is done now you've got the whole life to work i remember this some of the shiuch, they do this. They don't even take bay'ah seriously. They say, look, the main thing is islah. Do the islah. We'll do the sunnah of bay'ah when there's time. Okay. If there's time, we'll do it. No problem. That's not the objective. The real issue is having this connection of islah with a person of piety, knowledge, and wisdom. Having this connection, relationship. And also, I will add this, that sometimes, look, this... Normally you need a teacher, but look, this teacher, sometimes you, it's possible, it's difficult, but it's possible to have this rectification without even having a teacher. <coughs> By reading the books. So if there's one sheikh, like for example, someone, someone sees like someone like Sheikh Islam, Uthman, who's one of the great scholars, many books, every day you read his books, you attend his lectures, you don't keep on wasting his time by asking him, but you attend his lectures regularly, you read his books regularly on the topic of Islam and Tazkiyah. That's also kind of a type of, you're working on your heart, and you're working, working. It's possible. But then you will still, at the odd time, need to ask. So you might just, in a lecture, he doesn't know you, you don't know you, you don't need to really become part of a group or a cult or anything. You can just read something or something, you went and asked him, or someone connected to him, you asked him, that look, this is something I don't really understand. What is this, this way or that way? That's also possible. I know so, so many people who are more Sufi, without being part of a tariq or a group than people who are part of a group and a tariq. Sometimes people are part of a group with name. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum lived <coughs> tasawwuf without a name. Yet today we have people who have a name but have no tasawwuf. Sometimes the greatest diseases and illnesses and sicknesses of jealousy, of hatred, of enmity, of competition is in the people who attribute themselves to tasawwuf. My sheikh is better than your sheikh, and my group is better than your group. This sheikh, he's got a cult, and that sheikh has got his cult. The reason why the tasawwuf was 
came into existence was to remove all of this. So this extreme with like cultish type of tasawwuf, there's no place for that. Everyone wears a green amam, all of them, all of them green hats or pink socks. Or, so basically, I'm murid of the sheikh with the pink socks. Like this becomes like Muslims are separated. Tasawwuf should be such that all Muslims should, you shouldn't be, if someone feels that they go to a sheikh's gathering and he feels out of place because he's not wearing a pink sock or a, or a yellow scarf, then there's something wrong with that gathering. Because your message should be for everybody. There should be nobody who feels out of place in that gathering. So it's not part of a cult that we are part of this one group and I'm attributed to this. We are actually... We belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are abd of Allah. We are not a slave of anybody. So, this is what tasawwuf is. It's got nothing to do with this, what I said. Neither has it got anything to do with... Some people think tasawwuf is like dreams. There's a place for dreams in Islam, but it's got nothing to do with dreams. Kashf and karam. Kashf, like spiritual kind of intuition, you could say. That's not the objective of tasawwuf. Not the objective. Some, there could be someone who is extremely pious but never have any miracle karama in their life. That's not the objective. Karama basically means Allah honors you. You know karama, ikram, is from the word ikram. So many of you here may have had a karama but you don't know. You know sometimes you think, wow, subhanAllah, how did this happen today? I didn't even expect this. That's Allah honoring you. You've got a karama. Karama is no, it's not some super natural word that like suddenly you become like half human and half angel. It's basically Allah has honored you. It's part of, we believe in karamatul awliya al-haq. We believe Allah blesses more people. We believe in this. But it's not the objective. A great person is not that who, you know, goes like that and money comes out. That's not the sign of a pious person. Great dreams are not the sign of a pious person. Someone is being buried and suddenly it starts raining. That's not the sign. It's a slight indication. In our communities, oh, we went for janazah, it started raining. I said, don't say this. Say, we went for his janazah and I studied his eight years of his life and his life was in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah. That's the real sign of him entering Jannah. Not the rain, because the Hindus will say that, oh, suddenly the rain started when our Hindu sheikh was being buried as well. If these are the signs, suddenly the clouds move, then the Sikhs are being buried and the clouds are moving as well. This is not the sign of anyone's piety. The real sign is how they live their daily life. So kashf and karama is also not the objective. It can happen, we believe in them, fine. Don't make them a big deal. It happens, happens, no, it doesn't happen, no problem. Some people think tasawwuf is like spiritual healing. Taweez and you know mystics and this and that got nothing to do with the soul the spiritual healing that suddenly you know I become part of this group because the sheikh is now going to give me shifa shifa Allah gives so it's got nothing to do with any of these things um, and last the last last absolute last point I know I've been talking for a long time but the absolute last point in two minutes Tasawuf has also got nothing to do with what today the non-Muslims think Tasawuf is. In the West, non-Muslims, they actually praise Sufism. They praise Sufism, they like Sufism, they use the word Sufism. They, they like Sufi Muslims. They don't like the other extreme Muslims, extremists. They like the Sufis. The Sufis are good Muslims. The non-Muslims, the establishments, they like the Sufis. Because in their understanding, Sufi is not the one who is working on the heart to rid himself with pride and arrogance and jealousy and hatred and connecting with Allah and remembrance of Allah and having humility. That's not their definition. Their definition is someone, Sufi is the one who pleases his soul. So do some yoga, do some you know, music, you know, do some spiritual, you know, do all of these things. So their understanding of Sufism is completely opposite. Because according to them, Sufism is pleasing the soul. According to the real meaning of Islam, Sufism is going against your soul. You, your, your soul wants to do something, but you're fighting against this mujahada. You're going against it. You feel like being angry at someone, but because of the soul and Islam, 
you're going against your nafs. So you're breaking your heart. You're displeasing your soul. And when they talk about Sufism, it's about pleasing the soul. It's two opposites, two, two, two different worlds. So they, they don't talk about the real Sufis. This is why they praise. They just like all this. And Sufi and be a non-practicing person. You could be a Sufi, you could be a non-Muslim. And I'll end with this one. When I was studying in Syria, I remember I used to attend this uh, dhikr gathering that used to take place in the masjid which is attributed to Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, rahimahullah, great Sufi. His grave is there next to it. There's a masjid and there was this Sheikh called Sheikh Ahmed Habbal, rahimahullah, he's passed away as well. A great, really, really pious Sheikh. I think passed away in 2009, I think. So after Fajr on Fridays, he used to have this gathering. So I used to go and attend there and he used to have a small talk talk. So I once saw, like, right at the back, there were two people sitting, looked like foreigners, came from outside, you know, from, there was, I heard them speaking English. So I went to them, I said, I said how are you? Assalamu alaikum. They shook my hands. So I said, you look like, where are you from? Do you speak English? I said, yeah, we speak English. Do you speak English? I said, yeah. I said, I'm not, I'm not Syrian. I'm actually from England. Where are you from? We're from London. So, oh, okay. Very good. So, uh, what are you doing here? I said, I've been studying here for a year. This was in 2002, three when I was studying in Syria. So we started talking. So I said, what brings you to Syria, to Damascus? He said, oh, we've come here just to visit, you know, the historical sites. And also, we want you to come and pay our respect and our... We wanted to pay, uh, pay a visit to this shrine of this great Sufi Sheikh Mu'yuddin ibn Arabi. I said, oh, you know about him? He said, yeah, yeah, we're Sufis. I said, who's your Sheikh? I said, uh, we have a Sheikha. She, she's in London. She's our Sheikha. I said, okay, you have a Sheikha. I thought he was talking about his wife. He said, you have a Sheikha. So I said, oh, you're, you're, you're into Tasawwuf. He said, yeah, we love Sufism. I said, oh, that's amazing, mashallah. So, uh, uh, were you born Muslim or when did you become Muslim? Said, no, no, we're not actually Muslims, but we're Sufis. <laughs> <laughs> we're not Muslims, but we are Sufis. I said, you're not Muslim. No, no, we're not Muslims, but we're into Tasawwuf. We're Sufis. So this is their understanding of Tasawwuf, which is completely a different world. You will see non-Muslim dhikr gatherings. If you go on YouTube, you'll see that there'll be women, men and women all holding hands in circles. Some of them wearing skirts till here. Ella Allah, Ella Allah. They'll be doing all this dhikr and, you know, skirts, short skirts. This is, let alone anything to do with, to do with tasawwuf, this has got nothing to do with Islam. In Islam, tasawwuf is only, what I said, working on one's heart for the remainder of our lives, purification of the soul, purification of the heart, and normally you need a teacher, a good teacher, who will teach you regarding this topic, and that's it, and there's nothing more than that, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the true understanding of Deen. And uh, we end with this. Alhamdulillah. Wa astaghfirullah wa sallam 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 wa